Okay, so we're going to conduct a controlled experiment to see whether the food we give to students alters their stress levels. Description of the experiments laid out, we allocate students to two groups and we measure their stress levels. The two groups that we're talking with, this is a thought experiment, but we thought we'd let them have the uh, cola and crisps. Um, that's what's being eaten by the first group. And we'd let the second group um, have rum truffles, um, just to get them par to participate in this experiment. What we need to know is to demonstrate that the treatment is effective. So how do we do that? First, we specify a null hypothesis that the treatment has no effect. And this is the, the hypothesis we wish to disprove. Now, saying that the treatment has no effect is equivalent to saying that the population mean for group 1, one of the foodstuffs, is the same as the population mean for group 2, one of the other foodstuffs. So, allocate the students, collect the data, and we measure a test statistic against that null hypothesis. Test statistic we're going to use will be the sample mean for group 1 minus the sample mean for group 2. So far, so good. The difficulty is we have to decide whether that test statistic is far enough away from zero to make us want to reject our null hypothesis. The aim of this podcast is to show us to how we do this. Now, if the null hypothesis were true, the statement goes it wouldn't matter what group we allocated people to because we'd get the same outcome. So, if the null hypothesis is true, we can shuffle people between the two groups, we can take the data between the two groups, and everything we see is what we would have seen if the null hypothesis were true. Observations about the data as we got it. They've been stressed. I've given them an open mental test. What's 2 plus 2? Two? What's 378,429 divided by 37.6? So you're all now very stressed. Okay, and I didn't even have to throw knives at you. Any observations about the two groups? <laughs> what do you notice about their measurements, their readings? Yes, please. It does indeed look as if the um, control group um, has the lower values and it looks as if the treatment group have higher values, but there are overlaps. Um, James here, 3.16, he's higher um, than some in the treatment group. So there's overlaps, there's noise, but that's the experiment we did, the thought experiment. They had the pre they had a treatment, um, they got allocated to groups, We've measured their cortisol levels. Um, and in fact, you look mind-bogglingly relaxed. So you're, you're Miss Cool, okay? So there's a surfboard to make me look very cool. And you look pathologically anxious, so because you've worried so much, you can put this jacket on to make sure nobody bumps into you. Okay, so that's the key idea of all of this. Um, that's the data we got. What we can now do is measure the difference between the two groups. So if I sum the values for the treatment groups, um, I, I won't put it up on the visualizer and blind them, but if I add 2.22 to 3.61 to 5.13 to 4.95, and then divide that by 4, I get 3.98. <coughs> so the mean cortisol change in my treatment group is 3.98. On the other hand, if I sum 0 0.15, 0 0.9, 0 0.57, and 3.16, I get 1.2. So my test statistic will be the difference between the two means. My test statistic will be 3.98, the mean of group 1, minus 1.2, which is the mean of group 2. So the mean difference observed in our data is 2.78. Now what would that be if there were no difference between the treatments? What would the difference in means be if there were no difference between treatment and control? Say it. Zero. zero. Okay, if there were no difference, it would be zero. Now, it isn't zero, but what we don't know is whether it's non-zero due to chance or non-zero due to something systematic. So, at this stage, um, we now start musical chairs. Now, if you think you had an easy job, you now have to sing along to provide some music while they're shuffling around. When the music starts, you have to shuffle around so that you're all in different positions, and I don't want all of one group at the end and one group at the other, so shuffle yourselves around, make yourselves...
They seem to have shuffled themselves before we got ourselves organised. Anyway, <laughs> this is the whole point of what we're saying about if the null hypothesis were true. Because we now have, and if you can swap your notices round, it's very subtle, but we have what's in inverted commas a treatment group, these four people here, and what is, again, in inverted commas, the control group. If the null hypothesis were true, um, it wouldn't matter whether you were mega anxious or mega cool. It doesn't matter what you've done in terms of consuming coke or rum truffles. The levels you get would be the same. So we've had a couple of changes. James is now in the so-called treatment group. And the point is, James actually had coke and Pringles. But what we're saying is, if the null hypothesis was true, we could have allocated James to the treatment group. He could have had a one truffle. He would have got exactly the same value. Because under the null hypothesis, these treatments have no effect. That's the big idea about null hypotheses. If you get your head around that, all the rest of stats is easy. So what do we do if we're doing this randomization test? We can now sum up the numbers. 3.16 plus 4.95 plus 5.15 plus 0.57 divided by 4. Subtract the two means, and we're saying that is a difference in means we could have got if the null hypothesis were true. It's not what we did get, but it could have been what we would have got were the null hypothesis true. Off you go. Let's have another shuffle round. Um, the and then shuffle again. Okay. So we now have, and then again, another shuffling. And what we're saying, if the null <laughs> hypothesis were true, it wouldn't matter that Miss Very Cool and surfboarding all the time and completely relaxed had ended up in the treatment group. Although she really had Pringles and crisps, what we're saying is the treatment doesn't work. So it doesn't matter that we allocated her to the control group and she got the value she got, she would have got the same value from the treatment group. And we can do this and do this and do this in a computer thousands of times. We're very quickly going to run out of patience. Have another shuffle. Shuffle yourselves around again. So why is the shuffling justified? Spend two minutes discussing with your neighbour What's this business about the null hypothesis, and why does that let me shuffle them around the way it is? Okay, if you do that, a couple of minutes yapping, we can get them off the stage and sit them down in the meantime, give them a round of applause. Okay, so. Here we have a larger data set. We drew the student data from the same data set, but we have two groups, group one and group two. Both have been subject to different treatments, and we can summarize the difference between these two groups by finding the sample mean for group one and subtracting the sample mean for group two. If we do this, we get 2.72. This is our observed test statistic. That's the difference in sample means based on the way we actually collected the data. Now, if the null hypothesis is true and the treatment has no effect, we, we're saying we could just as easily have allocated some of these to the opposite groups, we'd have got the same results. And in that case, we shuffle the data. We can do this only under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Shuffle the data from group to group, this is what we're saying the treatment has no effect. Measure the difference between the two sample means, and we get another reading for a shuffled, a randomized test statistic. We can repeat this. Shuffle the data again, calculate the two sample means, subtract one from the other, we obtain the value 0.16. Shuffle again, we obtain the value minus 0.07. And we can continue this shuffling as many times as we want. Every time we shuffle the data from one group to the other, we get a slightly different randomized test statistic. And eventually, 
um, we can build up a distribution of all these randomized test statistics. So this histogram that's building up is a summary of all the values of the randomized test statistics we obtain. Shuffle again, value slightly negative. Shuffle again, value slightly positive. We carry on uh, because it's a nice round number and generate a thousand. And we can see out of all the shufflings, the typical value we obtain for the difference in sample means is quite close to zero. Whereas values as large as plus or minus two are somewhat rarer. Now, if we re-display our original observed test statistic, 2.78, you can see there are not many values that are larger than this, and indeed there are not many values larger than minus 2.78. And it's the proportion of these shufflings that exceed, that are either larger than plus 2.78 or minus 2.78, that we're treating as a p-value. The proportion of random shuffles that are more extreme than our observed test statistic.